The picture was dark indeed. Man was caught in the curse brought about by his own sin. He had polluted himself, and in so doing he had polluted everything around him. The pollution problem today is just a side effect of the real problem, man's personal pollution, man's continual sin. He had done exactly what Satan, the deceiver, wanted him to do. Adam and Eve rebelled against God and lost paradise. And even today, every man rebels against his God and the process of personal and environmental pollution continues. What can be done? Well, hello everyone. I'm glad you've joined me today because we want to answer that question in our continuing study of Genesis chapter 3, the solution to pollution. There are two problems here that need a cure. First, man's personal pollution needs to be cleansed. And then, man's environment needs to be cleansed. Since the environment is polluted by sinful man, and is a consequence of man's pollution, I think it's most necessary that man be cleansed. Have you ever noticed that when things look the darkest, God shines the brightest? Genesis 3 records the tragic story of man's pollution of himself and the curse which followed. And yet right there in the middle of these dismal details is found the first promise that God will care for man's sin. In Genesis 3.15, God says to Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now what do you suppose it means that the seed of the serpent shall bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but that the woman's seed would bruise the head of Satan's seed? Well, the answer to that question is found in the New Testament. There is frequent reference in the New Testament to the sons of Satan, the seed of the serpent. Speaking of the Pharisees and the hypocrites, Jesus once said, You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. Jesus called them sons of snakes, the seed of the serpent. In another bout with the Pharisees, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's found in John chapter 8, verses 42 through 44. Jesus had Satan sized up pretty well, didn't he? The Bible depicts the seed of the serpent as anyone who is a liar, who hates God, and who does not recognize the deity and lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, on the other hand, is the seed of the woman. Who is this to be identified with? Well, ultimately, the seed of the woman is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The promise that the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman was fulfilled when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross of Calvary. You see, the bruising of the heel is not a fatal blow. Satan did not deliver a fatal blow to Jesus on the cross. For Christ Jesus rose from the dead just three days later. In the analogy of Genesis 3.15, this was just a bruise to the heel. However, friends... The seed of the woman, Christ Jesus, is promised to bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. And there will come a day, mark it down, there will come a day when Jesus will deal a fatal blow, a bruise to the head, to Satan and all the sons of Satan, those who reject Jesus Christ as Savior and who follow their father, the devil. They must appear at the great white throne judgment. And Jesus says to all who appear there, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, verse 41. Now, here's the hitch. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. That means you and me. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10. In fact, David confessed to God, 
For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51, verses 3 through 5. Man not only is a sinner because he was born in sin and inherited it from his parents, but he's a sinner because he chooses to sin every day. You do it, friends, and so do I. We are all polluted. We are all sinners. Now, since we have committed sin, unfortunately, we are all included in the seed of the serpent. We all need cleansing. First John chapter 3, verse 8. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now that's the message of Genesis 3.15 as well. As a matter of fact, that's the message of the Bible. Man is polluted by sin. But oh, I have good news for you, friends. Jesus came to deliver us from the clutches of sin. Just before David uttered the words in Psalm 51, which I read just a moment ago, he said these words, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Psalm 51, verse 2. You see, David was begging for cleansing from his personal pollution. In order for him or anyone to be cleansed, this cleansing must be done by a clean individual. And since we're all polluted, we cannot cleanse ourselves and... Friends, we can't cleanse one another. We need someone who is free from personal pollution to cleanse us. And there is only one person who fits that description. The seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. And you know that he, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. If we're to be cleansed from personal pollution... It must be done by Jesus Christ. He alone is qualified. He alone is without sin. Hebrews 9, verse 22. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission, no cleansing. You see, throughout the Old Testament, God demanded the shedding of innocent blood, the blood of a lamb without spot or blemish as a sacrifice for the atonement of sin. Innocent blood, blood of one who is totally free from pollution. That's what was necessary to cleanse the individual from sin. And my friends, the only pollution-free individual who has ever lived, Jesus Christ, died for you for just that purpose. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 tells us, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, Jesus' blood flowed and he paid the penalty for my sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans six twenty three. I deserve to receive death for my personal pollution, my sin. But he died for me as he did for you. His blood can cleanse each of us from sin. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Whether it's before we're saved or after we're saved, only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us from sin. The only way for us to rid ourselves of sin, which is inherently ours, is to ask Jesus to cleanse us. He that has the Son has life, the Bible says, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. Ask Jesus to cleanse you. Listen, friends, the solution to pollution is Jesus Christ. The most pressing need in our society today is for individuals to receive the cleansing which only Christ can give. Man may clean up his environment and still die in his sins because he is still the seed of the serpent. 
We must receive Jesus Christ and be saved to be free from personal pollution. We gain nothing if we legislate clean air and water and do not allow Christ to clean up the individual. It is to no avail at all to die in a clean environment and go to hell because our relationship with Jesus Christ is an improper one. Let's make sure that we are cleansed by His blood and we're living by His word. Now, am I saying to you that if everyone on earth became a Christian, this would be a pollution-free environment? No, not at all. Does it mean if there were more Christians, there would be less pollution? Well, that may be true, but Christians can be and presently are polluters of the environment just like everybody else. Our major task is to take the message of the gospel to polluted man. However, in doing so, friends, we do not have the right to destroy what God has created. Our environment is polluted as much by cleansed individuals, the saved, as it is by uncleansed individuals, the unsaved. Our earth is polluted because of man's sin. When man fell from fellowship with God, he became proud and greedy, and this pride and greed later developed into materialism, the kind of thing that Jesus criticized in Matthew chapter 6. Even many Christians have become thing-oriented today instead of God-oriented. Things become more important to us. And friends, many of those things are the things that are polluting our environment. We're more concerned about octane than we are about others. We're more interested in horsepower than we are in heaven. Materialism has led mankind to gain a profit at any price. And today, we are reaping the results of that attitude. Well, what can a Christian do to cut down on environmental pollution? What can you and I do as believers, those who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, what can we do to help our environment? Well, we can show the world that things are not as important to us as the souls of men. And we can be less materialistic. We can take that which we would have spent to add to our earthly luxury and pollute our environment at the same time, and we can give it to God. We can cease our endless spending and consume less. And when we consume less, friends, it automatically means that there is much less waste. We can set the example by not littering God's green earth. Yes, friends, there are a lot of things we can do if we but care. But caring does not begin with cans along the highway. Caring begins with our neighbor. Caring begins with our friends. Caring begins with knowing that people without Jesus Christ are going to die of pollution. Not just die from choking on the air or drinking impure water, but die spiritually and eternally because they do not have Jesus Christ as Savior. While we spend our time thinking about cleaning up the environment, dear friends, let's not lose our perspective here. Men and women need cleaned up because they are the ones who pollute the environment. And if we're going to spend time and energy and money on cleaning up the environment, and we should, let's not forget that that only counts for time. But man's soul counts for eternity. The key to the Christian's role in the battle against pollution is stewardship. Let's use wisely what we have, and let's cease our endless quest to gain more. Let's realize that we are strangers and pilgrims here in the earth. Our real home is in heaven. But the way we treat this temporary home will show the Father how we appreciate what he's given to us. We must invest our lives and our means in things that count. How do you suppose God looks upon the way we're treating our temporary home right now? The problem of pollution is indeed a serious one. This problem, however, is far more serious than the average person realizes. Most people think of pollution only in terms of air and of water, of pesticides, of the Bhopal tragedy, of Chernobyl, but most do not think of pollution with regard to the deeper problem, the problem of their own personal 
pollution. Listen, friends. The solution to pollution is Jesus Christ. We are the bearers of that message. How we live witnesses every day to both personal and planetary pollution. Live as an example of a person who has found cleansing from sin, and one who, because of that, because of our personal cleansing, is concerned with those around us. Let others know that we have found the solution. We know the solution to our own problem of sin, and because we are free from the debt of sin, we are going to set the example by our lifestyle and provide the solution to our environment as well. God wants us to live on a green earth. That's why he created it this way. But in order to do so, friends, it is absolutely essential that our hearts be white as snow. You are now at the end of this series of messages on the earth, evolution, and ecology done for us by Dr. Woodrow Kroll of Back to the Bible. 